Hello everyone and welcome back to my latest speed build in the Far Cry 5 Arcade Editor. Today we are looking at a map called Rupture and it is a heavily urban focused multiplayer map and one that I am exceptionally proud about in terms of its visuals and its gameplay. If you are new around here, this series works quite simply. I build a number of maps in the Far Cry editor and record the process from start to finish. I then throw that footage into some editing software, speed it all up, and then commentate over the process, giving you my tips and any lessons I learned along the way. Then a week from now, always a week after the speed build, I post gameplay of the map in action with real players. However, in that video, I talk about the pros and cons of the map after testing it in reality. And once again, it just builds that objective nature of our map building and tries to ensure that we learn and grow and just build better maps each and every time. This series has proved pretty damn popular on the channel, so be sure to subscribe if you like the sound of what you hear and be sure to check out all the other builds because there are plenty here on the channel. Now let's start talking about the map itself. So the theme for this one, as I said, is heavily urban focused, specifically a residential street, but within a pretty major American city. The inspiration for this actually came many months ago when I was playing the game A Way Out. And I played that with my partner. And in one of the cutscenes, one of the characters lives on a sort of traditional inner city American street with medium density apartments, but you can still definitely see the CBD and the towers in the distance. So that was the premise of the design. The layout of the map is actually relatively simple and it's a relatively small map by my standards as well. If you look at the design of this map from the top down, it's basically a dollar sign. You have the single line going down the middle of the S, and that is the main street. And then the sort of curve of the S going back and forth are the flanking opportunities. And I hope that little description there will become more apparent as the build continues. You'll be able to see that design come together. The map features some varied flanking opportunities. So the main fighting takes place down the main streets, which is covered and blocked in by these buildings I am placing down now. And then the flanking options include a sort of derelict alleyway, which is quite interesting visually. And then also some gardens behind some residential apartments, which you can see me playing with here. The map does go through quite a big evolution as I have a huge thank you to pass on to the members of the Sand Place Test Team, the Xbox club we have on the Xbox platform. And we play my maps and your maps as well every Sunday night at 11 p.m. West Australian time. These guys had a huge say in the overall outcome of this map in terms of its gameplay, in terms of its visuals, and it went through such a major evolution and a good one in my opinion. So I offer a huge thanks to those guys who played it time after time, testing all the little changes until it was just about the final product you will see today. Moving on to the back area here. This design is the first thing that the sand place test team suggested I changed. I wanted to have a bit of a claustrophobic garden back here where you have to sort of zigzag between the broken fences dividing each garden. But the guy said it was a bit too Mickey Mousey, if you know what I mean. It just zigzagged a bit too much. It was just an unnecessary chore to wind between the fences. So shortly you will see me jump back in and actually cling all that up. This map here actually was really easy to get started with. Normally the maps take ages because you've got, the, got to get the terrain right, but this map was so easy to start off with because it was just a traditional American city street. It's a grid system, so you're dealing with 90 degree angles. There was practically no major terrain elevation, so it was just so easy for me to place down the footpaths, the buildings, just rotate them on 90 degrees, and it just came together so quickly. In fact, I managed to get this map into a playable state within two hours, and that was actually a good motivation for me. I actually started building this map a couple of hours before the Sandplays test team had a test session on a Sunday night. 
And I thought, I wonder how much I can actually get done. I wonder if I can race and get this into a remotely playable state. One that doesn't have details, but just enough so we understand the structure of the map and make sure the core design actually works from a gameplay perspective. And I was really fortunate that because, again, it's all 90 degree angles, flat terrain, that I could throw it together quick enough. And the gentleman provided some great insight, and I was very fortunate that I took that approach because the advice they gave I could actually incorporate into the build process rather than have to undo anything, if that makes sense. So now you can see me really sort of rushing the basic elements of this map. But the reason why this build extends out to the 11 or 12 hours it actually took was because of the masses amount of detail you have to put into urban areas in order to make them believable and feel alive. That was the biggest challenge of this map, but one I enjoyed immensely because there were quite a few assets we could work with in terms of the watchdog assets that are in Far Cry 5. Now you can see me creating a bit of an interesting scenery in the background. The challenge of this map in particular was mainly creating a believable city around the relatively small playable area. You can see me outlining those dimensions right now. So I actually build entire streets that players can't really get to. And the reason for that was simply to create the facade that they were in a genuine inner inner city suburb that was part of a much larger area. I didn't want the players to think that the urban area ended right beyond the immediate buildings and then continued with the urban backdrop, which I put in uh, later on. So I actually build my own streets, even though players can't get to them. And I actually build my own semi skyscrapers at times as well, just to try and create that feeling that this is a genuine and real city around them. I wish we had flowing traffic. That would be amazing, just like an animation in the background of cars zooming down a street, even if it's just a 2D sort of aspect. You can't actually collide with the traffic, just purely a scenery thing. That would have made this map feel even more alive, but unfortunately, that's not a capability we have. Now you can see I'm starting to put some cover inside the main street or down the main street. And... Part of the frustration with this particular part of the map, and it's something I've heard many people talk about, is the lack of cars that you can't drive but aren't destroyed, if that makes sense. We have plenty of wrecked vehicles, but they all look super damaged. I wish we had some cars that you can't drive but actually still look in a relatively decent state, just trying to make it look believable. Now you can see I'm trying to use some decals to create a parking lot over here. There's sort of two main sides to this map. One team spawns on the service station side, or the servo side as we would call it here in Australia. And then one team spawns on the bar side. And that was just to create two distinctions, add some variety to the spawning locations. And they're basically the two landmarks of the map, the bar and the servo. It's the spawn locations of each team. And you'll often hear me refer to the different sides of the map as the bar team side and the servo team side. That's how I will try and explain this speed build. So now you can see I'm actually building up this little alleyway here. You might have seen me place down these sort of random fence boxes as well. That was more just to add some cover in the alleyways and add a bit of variety to what is otherwise quite a square map. So that's the whole thinking behind that. The biggest challenge on this map, and you can see me playing with it here, are the spawning locations. I had a massive, massive challenge trying to balance the spawning locations, especially given the fact that this red team over here, the bar team, seemed to get constantly trapped in their spawn, even though the variation in the spawn locations was very similar to the other team. And we played game after game, mixing the teams up, completely different players, and it seemed like almost always the bar team would get spawn trapped. I do talk or I do get around to fixing that later on and you'll see me do that and I'll uh, discuss that when we come to that particular solution. But now you can see I've adjusted this garden back here. Instead of having the zigzag fences, I incorporated a little shed with a turret inside. The turret isn't used too much. It's just a sort of pinning down opportunity for any players that would like it. And I'm just trying to think of how I can fill up this garden now and what I can actually do to make it interesting. 
The next thing I do here, which I am actually really proud about, and it's an un, oh, I wouldn't say an unnoticed detail, but one you wouldn't really notice if you weren't looking for it, and that is the creation of some planters. Now, the buildings here on this map are very, very grey. They're very drab. I wish we had some more colour options for each of the structures in the editor. So to try and mix that up a bit and make this street feel like it as I is actually remotely lived in and not just some derelict wasteland, I use some generic shapes here to create some gardens. And you can see me playing around with some brick sort of exteriors, some retaining walls, and then putting some grass on top, and then ultimately the bushes as well. Now, these serve two functions. Number one, they actually add some damn color to the street, which is nice. And the second one is that some of these planters stick out a little bit and they actually provide a little bit of cover. Now, the reason why I like it is because it's not a tremendous amount of cover. You can't really rely on them purely, but if you do get in a sticky situation where you're exposed to fire on the main street, you can hide behind these planters. And it's just a unique feel because they're a sort of structure I create from scratch, not something you can place down that's pre-built. So it feels very personalized, this map, and it's something I really enjoyed building, even if the flickering textures were a pain to get right. I was really pleased with the end result of these, and they took some time, as you can see here. I have to play around quite a bit. I was very fortunate in the sense that the buildings on the left and right of the main street aren't enterable. So I could basically morph the generic shape straight into those, and you couldn't see the rough edges of the map. This, again, is where the interest in this particular series comes, isn't it? You get to see the little cheat systems I do to try and hide any rough edges and get cheap and easy results. So now you can see I'm actually testing the cover they provide running around the map, just working out how far I want these sort of planters to stick out and the amount of cover I want them to provide. I didn't want them to be frustrating where you could hide behind and just blind fire through the foliage. And the reason why they don't stick out too much is to combat that. Even if you're hiding behind, if someone gets on the other side of the street, they will probably be able to pick you off. So it's a small little detail, something you can rely on if you get in a tough situation, but not necessarily a tactical advantage you want to actively pursue. Using the plants, just trying to rotate them all just so the texture didn't look too repetitive. It's amazing how a bit of rotation each time can just mix it up a little. I also put some lower shrubbery down on the very bottom to try and hide any sort of generic shape textures that don't look the best always. And then you can see me here just playing. As I discover areas that don't offer much cover, I just put another planter in. So it really was something that was useful because I could take the core structure of the map and fine tune it so ever so lightly as I saw fit with these planters. So it was a really neat idea and one that definitely played a huge role in what I believe to be the success of this map. One aspect you may be noticing is some poor alignment between the footpaths and the apartment buildings. Some of them don't have flat fronts. In fact, very few of them do. So you might see doorways with sort of holes between the footpath and the building where there's just black tarmac on the ground. Someone on the same place test team actually pointed that out to me. I could not believe I had missed it. And uh, he went a long way in actually helping me fix that up. So I'm extremely appreciative again, because those guys not only guide me in terms of gameplay, they guide me in terms of visuals as well. And this is the key thing I love about the guys that really support this channel, whether it be you guys in the comments or the guys on the Sam Place test team. You guys are always so friendly and constructive when you give feedback. I'm not here to get endless praise for my maps. I never call them perfect, and I am open about that. I am by far not the best builder in Far Cry. But you guys push me to build my maps a bit better each time. You give me new ideas, and you're just so supportive in the way you give that feedback. So for that, I am immensely grateful. Now I'm running around, throwing a few more planters in here. I identified that the alleyway here didn't provide too much cover from the main street. So I again put some planters there so that the players could protrude out of the alleyway a little bit and look down the main street, but still have some sort of cover. 
Now I am basically copying a lot of the plants over. There was only a select few plants that really sort of fit with the theme of this map and sort of would work within the very small space those plants has provided. So I didn't use too many bushes, but I feel like I combined them and rotated them in unique ways so that it doesn't look too repetitive. Now you can see me here, I'm just sort of building out this backyard area, trying to make it a bit more unique, putting down some trees manually, trying to make this backyard shed look a little bit more used. Even a little bit of terrain variation, but you really don't notice it too much. Now we're jumping down onto the main street. I really wanted to detail the hell out of this little structure here, this little selling booth, this magazine stall, whatever you want to call it. And I put so much detail into it, I was so happy. I put the American flag in there again to try and add some context to where this map was based. I put all this detail in, and then I discover that most, if not all of these objects had physics attached, and it caused that annoying issue where you could not uh, test your map or even publish it because of some clipping items. I spent ages trying to find out which one it was, but in the end, I just have to practically delete all detail from this little stall because I could not find anything that would let me get past that clipping issue. It was very frustrating to say the least. You can see me jumping in and out of the menu, trying to find any sort of compromise, but I just could not pull it off in the end. Now you can see me extending the main street quite far away. I wanted you to be able to look down the length of the street, even if you could not go all the way and sort of add some context to the city. As I get further away, I'm not worrying too much about the paths overlapping and the texture glitches that come with that because you simply cannot see the map from a high enough point where you see those texture issues. I put a bridge at the end here as well. I was trying to create the illusion of a railway, a, let me try that again, a railway that went over through the city. It was quite tricky to actually pick a bridge that sort of suited the aesthetic of the city. This is what I go with in the end. I'm not sure if it was the best fit, but it's so far in the distance that you really can't critique it too easily unless you're looking for nitpicking. Here you'll also see the shortcuts I take in terms of the street detail. To save memory, I don't necessarily put sidewalks all the way down the extra streets because if you can't see them from the playable area or even if you just push the boundaries for a few seconds, they're not worth putting in. They just take up unnecessary memory. Now I'm filling in these main streets, just trying to use a bit of a variety of the buildings. And I do something here that I don't normally do. I actually put down the backdrop relatively early in the build. We're only about a third of the way through it at this stage. Normally, that's the last thing I do. The reason why I put the backdrop in this time was because I was struggling for a bit of inspiration on how to build up the immediate city around the playable zone. There were only so many structures I could actually use and I had to combine them in ways that made it interesting. So I actually looked to the backdrop for inspiration. And what I tried to do was have the taller buildings towards the skyscrapers in the backdrop and then the sort of smaller apartments towards the smaller aspects of the backdrop as well. Basically trying to create the illusion that there's a CBD at one end and that CBD basically lowers in density as you go the other direction. Essentially, I was trying to create a believable city as much as I could within the confines of the editor. Now I'm just placing down the surrounding buildings. Again, this was just to try and add that immersion that this was a real city. I spent ages trying to throw together these surrounding streets into new and unique ways. You'll also see me start to stack some apartments. When I jumped into the editor, even though there were streets immediately around the playable zone, the heights of the structures around the main area were simply so tall that you couldn't really see those buildings beyond. So you could see the immediate buildings on the main street and the backdrop buildings, but it appeared as if there was nothing really in between, which really suggested that there wasn't much detail in the map. So now you can see me actually stacking some of the buildings, just trying to create that believable city feel like you're in a varied urban environment. 
the actual way they morph together isn't fantastic, and you'll probably see some horrible combinations because they're not designed to be stacked. But in the heat of the battle, I really don't think you're going to notice any of these rougher edges of the map, if I'm honest. You can even see some of them don't even have bases. I just sort of raise them up and then delete the lower level. And that, again, is because you can't ever see the base of that building. You simply see its higher levels. So, again, I'm just trying to save memory where I can and stack buildings according to the areas that look a bit plain in the distance. In terms of the major skyscrapers, I don't use too many, simply because we only have about five to choose from. And I didn't want to repeat them too much, so I relied on the backdrop to sort of fill in that massive skyscraper aspect of the city, because that offers far more varied structures. Now you can see I'm jumping in trying to build up the greenery around the map, and just get a feel for the cover on the main street, and see what the surrounding city looks like from the playable zone. I often jump into the map and jump back into the editor, just trying to find out what areas look plain, what areas need a bit of building up around. And where do I go to next? Again, I spend a lot of time doing this. I fine-tune the hell out of this. So my background is in, well, partially. My degree is partially in urban design, so I have a very big knack for city design. I have a very big sort of, I fuss over it, let's be honest, I fuss over this, the, the look of my cities, and it's part of the reason why I have put off urban maps for so long, because I know I am just too much of a perf perfectionist when it comes to building them, and I don't say that in a good way, it's an annoying aspect. Out the back of the bar there, I built a little bit of a spawning zone, I didn't want players always spawning in the bar itself, because that could be a spawn trap. And now I'm actually blocking off the street, so you should actually get a better idea of the limits of this map soon as well. I'm trying to sort of detail the city a lot more, put some rubbish down. This really was the fun part of the map, trying to find out what assets I could use to really bring this city to life. I wanted it to look run down, but not necessarily necessarily derelict. I wanted it to feel as if this was a city that had gone through a bit of a riot or something like that, a bit of moderate damage here and there, but by and large something you could certainly move back into if you wanted. So that was the balance I had to strike. Going apocalyptic might have been easier because you really could just go all out with the assets and make it look truly cluttered, but again that wasn't the look I was going for here. Now I'm planting some different trees down the street as well. Originally I only had the trees in the sort of main playable zone just to add some cover, but then I realized that looks stupid if you look down the streets in the distance and see that there's no more trees. It's very obvious they're purely there for gameplay. So I built the trees further down the street just to make sure it all looks realistic and cohesive. I put down these planter blocks here. Um, I think they call them male plant pots as in M-A-I-L. I'm not sure why they use that name, but they were very good. They worked very well with the sort of concrete structure and design of this map, and they also added a fair chunk of cover. When you crouch down by them, they are the perfect height. You can duck over and shoot the enemies, you can duck from the side, but you're relatively protected. Like the custom planters that I made myself, the brick and generic shape ones, they offer that nice balance between having some cover but not taking too much space and not making the players too protected, so you do have to move. Now you can see in the alleyway, I'm building an almost construction site here with some holes. Now this was an idea I originally tried on a larger scale in a very popular map which was called Country Town Chaos. And when I say popular, not necessarily in terms of its overall play count, just in terms of the people who follow this channel and the feedback they give on my maps, that one received a lot of positive praise when it released. I dig into the ground creating these holes, but I take on board the advice I got from Country Town Chaos, and I actually come back and fill these holes with a little bit of water and some piping. So there's a bit of context as to why they might have actually dug the holes in the first place, which was something Country Town Chaos really lacked. It was just random holes, and you go, oh yeah, this is here for cover. I wanted to provide that same cover, but add a bit of realism as well. So I put the pipes in the ground, and then I add some lakes as well, some very shallow puddles just to create the idea that there's a burst water main. That idea actually served 
to help the players of the same players test team actually suggest what becomes the signature and even title of this map. The main street, I originally didn't plan to have anything other than just your usual street clutter, cars, all that sort of stuff. But when the guy saw these sort of mini construction sites around the edge, they suggested that I actually include a massive burst water main in the center of the map, one that links the two flanking options from the gardens to the alleyways. Now, the reason why that was such a good idea was because this map really did lack a centerpiece. All of my maps so far have some sort of key aspect, and this map really was lacking that until the guys made the suggestion. Initially, I was a bit skeptical, and the reason for that was because I wanted players to run from the alleys to the backyard gardens as quickly as they possibly could. I didn't want them getting caught in the crossfire of the main street. However, when I come to build that rupture area, the burst water main, you will see how I actually design it in a way that adds the cover so players can fight over the center of the street, but also ensures that the players can run from the alleyway to the gardens with relative ease, because this map is quite chaotic and the center street is an absolute death trap. Now I'm using some more planters, I sort of get creative in how I combine different assets here. These ones are meant to fit together, these planters and the specific foliage that goes in them, but they are separate assets. They don't come as a holistic sort of thing. So I try and build out this little cafe here, this bar, but then I encounter an immensely frustrating issue with the number of physics objects capping quite early. It's something I've had trouble with in the past and it was immensely frustrating because I wasn't able to detail the interior of this bar as much as I initially wanted, especially the second floor. I find ways around it to the point where I can detail a little bit more than I initially thought I would be able to because of the physics limits, but it's still not quite as much as I initially hoped. It also looked a bit plain visually, so I actually incorporated some of these temporary shades in there as well, ultimately, almost creating like a little market stall, which added a bit of cover for the players emerging from the bar when they're trying to get into the fight, but also adding a bit of visual variety as well, again, adding some splashes of green to an otherwise very grey map. I put some solid doors in as well, and then actually played with the idea of actual physics-based doors here as well. But I had the weirdest issue. I'm not sure if it was because of the physics limits that prevented me, but I would place them down and then they would actually duplicate in the map, even though only one would appear in the editor. So I actually scrapped that idea in the end just because it was an immense hassle. That truck over there actually serves as some pretty important cover and the one here as well. So that's why I actually block off the vehicles with the concrete blocks and the cones. Again, that comes back to the lack of static vehicles that look like they are remotely intact. So that's the reason why I use the drivable vehicles and actually just lock them in. You could also see back there, I put a turret down for the servo team and I also do the same for the bar team. And that was to try and prevent any sort of spawn killing on this map. The turrets are set up specifically so that you can't necessarily shoot down the main street. They can only have a sight lying on the areas around your immediate spawn, so they really are just a fail-safe if one team gets cornered back into their spawning location. I take a lot of time trying to balance that, and as we get further into the build, I'll show you how I tackle one of the biggest challenges on this map, which was that spawn killing issue. And I'll actually throw up some interesting sort of designs on the screen, some screenshots of the map that should illustrate what I tried to do to negate the spawn killing I was experiencing here on the map. Another challenge was trying to block off the streets in a way that didn't look repetitive and looked interesting. There were... Let me see, there would be six streets I had to block off because of the intersections. And yeah, trying to find original ways to do each of those was a bit of a challenge. But in the end, I eventually get there. And again, that was another area the Sand Place test team advised me on. Now you can see me just trying to dress up this service station a little bit more, trying to put some sort of rundown shrubbery around the back alleyway. Just trying to make it visually a bit more interesting. Something I'm doing a lot more these days is actually blending the textures. It's something I I knew was there, but I just always forgot to use some sort of blending technique. So you had really harsh transitions from 
uh, texture to texture. What I do in this particular map, I have the sort of lush green grass and then fade it with some sand into the asphalt. And that really just makes a nice smooth transition and makes the map look a bit cleaner and more realistic. Moving down the main street now, you get the sense I'm just trying to find out what areas need cover. Here you can see me trying to build another sort of semi-construction site to dress up this particular roadblock. These cones were a nightmare. These big thick ones here were incredibly annoying because if you put them down normally, they actually cause some clipping issues. The base of them, even though they were pretty much above the ground would still cause clipping issues. So you have to almost make them levitate ever so slightly to avoid that issue. However, you also have to watch out for the fact that if you levitated them too much, players would be able to see it. So it was really frustrating to work with those, but we get there in the end. Now I'm just trying to street detail a bit more, putting in some fire hydrants, which also add a splash of color, adding the reds and the greens to this map was a big focus from a visual point of view. Again, I'm detailing a lot of areas beyond the playable zone. Again, just trying to create that believable city environment. And these cars weren't too bad to use at a distance because you couldn't notice just how derelict and destroyed they were. I try and dense up the streets a lot more. I even make a night version of this map at a later date. And I'm not sure yet if I'll put gameplay of that in action just yet. But I... Yeah, it was good because some of these cars had sort of broken lights and lights already built into them. So when I made the night version of this map, some of the work was already done for me. Putting in bins now, again, trying to think of any sort of realistic street clutter that you would expect to find. And the other big thing was actually just trying to work out the spacing. How, you know, you don't think about this stuff, but how many bins should there be on a urban city street? How many... How much spacing should there be between the trees? You've got to compromise between gameplay and realism, and it's just stuff you don't really think about. If you were to stand on a city street, how far apart are the bins? You just don't think about that stuff unless you're looking for one. So when I was building this map, I was very self-conscious of just how much of the same object I was placing down, whether that be the bins or the fire extinguishers or anything like that. In terms of roadblocks, I was really struggling for ideas at this stage. So I thought, okay, if a riot has taken place, let's pretend this aspect, this roadblock over here is some sort of like police outpost where they set up a temporary HQ with supplies and a sort of briefing tent and yeah, just equipment to deal with the crisis. That was the desperate levels I got to in terms of detailing the roadblocks for the map. Now I'm jumping into the gardens a bit more, trying to play around with some more ideas. I plant this tree in this garden very soon as well, which adds some nice shade to the environment. This one here was a bit of an odd choice, if I'm honest. I, I saw this parking opportunity, this parking structure, which is designed for national parks, but in the end, I actually use it in an inner city environment. I just love the asset, even though admittedly it probably doesn't fit with the aesthetics of the map. Next, I'm going around adding a ton of like electrical transformers to all the buildings, just again trying to break up the monotony of these structures, which are quite simple and basic in their design. So adding loads of small details was a major focus of this map. Speed bumps are another example, trying to break up the harsh asphalt texture. And then I spend a ton of time also playing with graffiti in this editor. I don't think I've built a single map so far that has this level of graffiti on it. Now I'm playing with that graffiti, as I said, and I come back to street signs in a moment as well. The graffiti was a big pain because they can only be seen from one side. So trying to work out what that side was and then get it flush with the buildings was pretty frustrating. Obviously, you can make it snap to the structure, but very often it meant that the graffiti was sort of halfway in, halfway out of the brickwork. So I basically had to manually adjust the placement of every single piece of graffiti. So it was pretty annoying to say the least. But it was immensely fun to sort of bring this city to life with all these little details. I'm not sure again how much they are noticed, but from a editor's point of view, it just felt so good to bring this city to life with all these little details. I sort of go between your basic sort of 
typical business advertisements and then the raw, unruly graffiti you often find in inner city areas. Fortunately, all the graffiti already looks pretty faded. Nothing looks super brand new. And that suited me quite well because obviously this was meant to be a sort of older inner city American suburb. Next, I run around trying to detail the roads a bit more. This was another big challenge. It's something I dealt with when I built my racetrack, and that's something I strongly suggest you guys go and see. But just trying to make the roads themselves as good as the road, road tool is, trying to make them look believable and not too repetitive was a immense challenge. It was also annoying because you can only place eight roads at a time. And I had this really annoying issue where the intersections would cross over and the lines would just look very, very weird. So I had to abolish some of the other roads on the sort of outer streets that are there purely for scenery and then put some basically double the amount of roads I needed in the inner city area. I also put some more lines down manually, again, trying to have solid lines where stop signs are and just make the whole road network seem as believable as possible. Again, putting some arrows down as well, just to try and create that sort of visual appeal when it comes to the city. One thing I did do wrong, though, was the fact I put the main road or the correct side of the road on the left and now I live in Australia we drive on the left side of the road but obviously in America they drive on the right so that was a bit of a brain fade on my part but I don't think anyone has noticed just yet apart from the fact that I've just highlighted it to everyone that watches the channel but the fact that I have to highlight it hopefully means that it's not much of a actual issue and it's not going to break immersion too much. I spent a lot of time placing down these asphalt patches as well, just trying to create the idea that potholes have been filled in and that this is a very old suburb that has cracks in the road and is just very, very run down. And now you can see me building that signature part of the map that I alluded to earlier, and that is the rupture, the burst water main in the middle of the map. Now, this serves two purposes. Number one, it adds some visual variety. Actually, it says three. Number one, visual variety. Number two, it adds some cover when you get to the middle of the street. And number three, it actually marks the middle of the map. Because the alleyways are relatively narrow, it's actually really hard to judge from the main street where they are. And all of a sudden, you can find yourself right alongside the alleyways and just be shot from the side. Having this sort of burst water main really added a center point to the map and allowed me to basically... It basically added some sort of key structure that you could use as a reference point. You get an idea of who's winning the, the battle for space on the map by where the teams are. If one team holds that center trench, you can be pretty confident they are dominating the other team. Now you could also see that I built the pipe going across between the two alleyways. Now that obviously serves for visual sense. Obviously having a burst water main, you need a pipe and you need some water below it, but... That pipe also allows players to run from the alley to the gardens without actually falling into the trench itself. So it served two main purposes. It added the, added the cover, but it didn't come at the compromise of mobility. It didn't bog the players down. They didn't have to run around this trench if they wanted to get from the alley to the gardens. So that was a design compromise I was extremely happy with and one that turned out very well for the sort of rapid nature of this map because it's very fast paced and I was worried the inclusion of a trench you have to go around would limit flanking opportunities. Now I am just trying to build that up, make it look like it's got roadworks around it. I didn't want to put too much clutter in again around this particular area simply because I didn't want players tripping over endless things on this particular part of the map. It's definitely the busiest part of the map. There's a lot going on. It can be shot from many sides and it's just very intense. So it required a bit of balance between sort of having enough visual clutter to make it realistic, but not enough visual clutter to make it annoying. Put some stop signs in as well, sort of pedestrians beware. <laughs> and I looked for endless signs that I could use to sort of break up the roadworks because there's quite a few on this map, but stop signs seem to be the way to go. 
Now I'm just trying to add a bit of mud and some piles of sand, just trying to make it believable that there's some sort of wet texture around here from the burst water main. So I layered quite a few different textures on that part of the map. Now you can see me detailing the alleyway that is behind the gardens. This is purely for aesthetics. You can't go down this alleyway. And it does add some context though, because the fences for the residential area are relatively see-through. They've got loads of holes. So ensuring the alleys behind them were detailed was quite important. Now I'm just running through, understanding what areas need to be filled again from a player's perspective. We're sort of approaching the final 12 minutes of this build now, trying to detail every little bit as necessary. I also come back in and place a ton of invisible walls. You'll see me do that shortly as well, because tons of players were jumping on top of rooftops and getting really crazy unfair advantages. So that's something I definitely th should have thought about before I tested this map, but it was easy enough to fix before the final product. Here you can see me again extending those planters into the spawning sort of intersections. They were a bit too open, especially with spawn killing already being a problem. So I put these in and put the trees in as well to add that greenery and just add some shade and some cover for the players when they spawn. The next big challenge I sort of encountered with this part of the build was again trying to split up the spawning locations. And you'll see me towards the end of this build do the final touch, which I believe solves the spawning issues. Basically, the challenge I faced was the, the what I try and do when I build spawning locations on a map is basically create a risk versus reward approach. As you get closer to the enemy spawn, I want the risk to go up to subtly discourage players from attacking the enemy team at close range in their spawn. The problem, the way I do that is basically increasing the number of angles they can be shot from. I'll throw a display on screen right now by what I mean. The original problem with this map, especially for the bar team, was the fact that their spawning location basically only covered about a 90 degree angle or maybe a 100 degree angle. You could sort of see wherever they could spawn, whether it be on the left or the right, within the same viewpoint, no matter how close you were to their spawn. Getting shot from the side was quite a low possibility. So what I do later on in the map, I actually put some spawn locations further to the left and right. So your area of concern goes from being a 90 degree angle to a 180 degree threat. And again, that really helped break up the amount of spawn killing that took place, especially for the bar team. So that's a tactic I strongly suggest you guys try and implement as best you can in your maps. And it's pretty much the same technique I use in all my maps. I've just never really discussed it in this level of detail. That said, I probably still should have some sort of fail safe option for the teams on this map. Spawn killing isn't as much of an issue with this sort of new layout for the spawning locations. However, if one team is getting absolutely dominated, it can still be a challenge. Unfortunately, the fundamental layout of this map presented that challenge, and it's not something I could really patch an easy fix onto. However, as I said, it's not really a huge issue that is continuing to show its head anymore. Now, I actually found another bunch of buildings that I didn't realize were available assets. So you can see me again detailing the outer city area, just trying to bring it to life and make it look varied and interesting. I even had a few balconies here and there. I'm not sure how well they actually fit with the structures, but you can't really notice them, especially when you're fighting. I put a ton of air conditioning units and all that fun stuff on top of each of the rooftops, trying to make them all look interesting and varied. Plenty of solar panels around the place as well, which act as cover on the service station, but just as visual variety on the external buildings. I do also put some smoke detail on these little chimneys as well to create a believable structure as well. But I was really pleased with how the buildings turned out. They all look unique. They all look interesting from top to bottom. The bottom looks interesting because of the planters. The tops look interesting because of the different air conditioning units and all the ways they are combined. Obviously, all the graffiti as well really helps because that just adds some color and believability to the structure from the bottom to the top. And yeah, it just makes every building look unique and almost as if it has its own story. 
I put air conditioning units obviously on the buildings closest to the playable zone, but I also put them on the distant ones as well. Again, I just try and make as many fail safes as I can when it comes to believability. So I put the sort of air conditioning units on the far buildings as well, just in case any players had zoomed in with a scope or anything like that. Now I am building up the interior of the bar. Again, this was an immense challenge because of the problems that came with the limits on physics objects. So it's not as detailed as I wanted it to be, but I did the best I could with the limitations I had. A big problem was the fact that I could turn off the budget grid so I didn't have that horrible yellow square, but every time I hit that limit, it would reappear. I wish that wasn't a solid color. I wish it was transparent to a degree because when it enables itself, you can't see the damn floor. It's so frustrating. So that was immensely annoying as well, but we deal with it in the end. Now you can see me here playing around with the invisible walls, trying to work out where players might try and jump to, the advantages they might try and get from a vertical point of view. These fences, these little boxes I created for variety in the alleys were also a bit of a trap. One of the Sandplace Test Team members highlighted how you could jump and accidentally find yourself trapped in one of those. And because the fences around are practically solid, you can't see through you could have been stuck there the entire game if you did not have a grenade to kill yourself with. So it was very important I closed those off as well. I'm putting in the smoke effects now, obviously trying to work with white smoke. You don't really expect to see any black smoke coming from chimneys in a city unless it's proper industrial areas. So I pretty much used the same small selection there. Now I'm placing down a few more signs, just a little bit more detail to the streets, really putting the finishing touches here. Adding this big, big garage sign makes sense. It just worked with the structure. They go very well together. And this is the stage of the build where I really just fly around constantly trying to work out what needs detailing that little bit more. I play around with the time of day quite a lot as well. Originally, I settled for quite a early morning time, almost as if it's a morning with a bit of fog in the air. However, that really dulled out the color scheme of this map. So eventually, I revert back to a sort of midday time, and I minimize the amount of haze that's on screen as well. There is a little bit of haze, even in the final build of the game, but it's not obstructive in any way. You can clearly see enemies from across the map. It was purely to create that atmosphere of a little bit of air pollution, as you come to expect in urban environments, especially large American cities. I was fine-tuning the map boundaries as well, really trying to figure out where the players might try and get advantages with the invisible walls. So I spent a ton of time trying to get that right as well. We're in the final five minutes now, just about. I add some lights in here. What I tried doing here was almost creating some police cars. Now, at a distance, these actually look pretty believable. However, when you get close, you can see there's no actually source of the light. They're sort of just randomly appearing in thin air. However, it does add a bit of nice visual variety to the map, and just especially in the night version, it just adds some really cool atmospheric elements to the build. Now I'm running around just putting any trees where necessary, trying to build up the plants. One of the guys suggested that the plants were a little overkill, especially in the alleys, because players could actually hide inside them, and it was very hard to see them. I haven't fixed that yet. I haven't seen it on a massive... I haven't seen it become a massive issue just yet, but it is something I am going to continue to monitor. If players start taking advantage of the foliage too much for cover, I might have to put some invisible walls in there just to stop that from happening. Call of Duty do that in blackout with the bushes. You can't actually hide inside the tree or the light bushes themselves because they have almost a solid nature to them. So I might consider that for this map as well. Now I'm putting the final touches in in terms of graffiti. It is amazing how long it takes to make the maps come to life. This map really opened my eyes to game developers such as Rockstar who make the most believable environments. It is such a challenge. Yes, in Far Cry we have the challenge of not being able to put NPCs in our multiplayer maps, which does hurt the believability, but just making a place look lived in, especially urban environments, was so challenging, 
And yeah, it really opened my eyes to just how impressive it is when game developers create believable environments. It's all the little details that stack up. You don't no notice them in isolation, but their collection just makes a huge impact. So it took a long time, but it was definitely worth it putting all the final touches on the map. Trying to find signs that coincide with the structures as well. Some of them I treated as billboards, just random advertisements. Some of them I placed down in terms of trying to match the building to a sign. There you can see there's a, an example of where I'm just trying to do advertisements. There was farm supply on a sort of concrete structure, not something you would normally put together. Next thing I was doing, I had to sort of remove the roads wherever they went over a roadwork area because as much as I tried to put the sand texture down, it still showed the road texture beneath. So it looked really weird mixing the two. It just looked very cheap and, and tacky. I put these sort of access panels in the footpaths as well. Then these grates, I think I even put some smoke effects coming out of these almost sewer grates, just trying to add a bit of visual variety, but they're not so thick that they obscure player sight lines. There you can see me finally filling in those little weird overlaps where there was a small gap between the sidewalks and the structures. And because the sidewalks are sort of like a really light gray and the ground is a black tar, it was very obvious where those holes were. So again, I'm immensely grateful for the guidance from the guys in the sand place test team in helping me correct that little aspect of the build. Now I am putting in those small, tiny smoke effects, not too much detail. And we are in the final two minutes of this build right now. So I'll start focusing on what comes next. So obviously gameplay of this map will come in the following week. So seven days from now. And again, I'll reflect on the proper pros and cons of this map there. Then at the end of this month, just before or just after Christmas, it might be, we have the showcase of your winter maps. And I strongly urge you to build a map to that theme. I'll leave a link in the description to the full details of that challenge that you guys can take part in and get your own maps featured as well. As you know, I only do one speed build a month now in combination with the creations you guys make. So the next build, which comes in January, which sounds far away, but it's not, is actually another single player slash co-op experience. However, it is a Hitman inspired map. So I have three targets. I'm not going to tell you what the setting is, but you can basically complete the game in multiple ways. I'm trying to take the inspiration from the Hitman franchise and open up and create an almost sandbox feel to the world. It is limiting, obviously, by the amount of memory we have available and the amount of structures we can build, but I'm really excited with how it's coming together. It's near its completion, my end, and I cannot wait to show that off come January. Now I'm putting those final few details in, time of day, all that fun stuff, but we are just about there now on this map. It was an immensely fun build to create. I really enjoyed the simplicity of the terrain on this map, just having a flat surface to work with. Everything was able to come together so much quicker and I could focus on the details. Please stick around to see gameplay of this map in action. Here you can see me finally expanding the spawn risk from 90 degrees to 180 by putting some spawn points on the far left and right of the different areas. But as I said, that is it for this particular build. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you again to the Sandplace test team for helping me fine tune the hell out of this map. And I cannot wait to see what you guys will build for the December showcase challenge. And I cannot wait to see you in another video very very soon. Goodbye.